Hey guys, Chili here. Welcome back to 3D Fundamentals Tutorial 16. Today's topic is point lights. So up until now, we've been using directional light. Uh, and that's really good for modeling things like the sun, because the sun is, we can basically treat it as infinitely far away. And so its rays are basically parallel to uh, each other as far as we're concerned. And so they only really have a direction. And that works nice for like things like outdoor scenes. It can also work nice for things like a, maybe like a big warehouse with a lot of overhead lights, but it's going to break down in some situations. Like take a look at a scene like this. You've got a single light source in the middle of a room here. So what, what's going on here? Well, let's take, let's do a little diagramming in 2D. So let's say we got a basic scene like this. It has a light bulb in the middle of the room. It's got some object here. And we're gonna model this using a directional light. So we put our directional light pointing this way. Our object is lit like this. Seems okay. But now what if our object moves in the scene? What if it goes over here to the other side of the light bulb? Well, now this is gonna look very weird because the side of the object that's being lit is the opposite side from where the light should be coming from. And in fact, this is a feature of directional light sources. No matter where you move around in the room, the lighting of this object doesn't change. Moving something, translation does not affect lighting with directional light sources. So instead what we do is we don't give the light source a direction. We give it a position in the world and then we determine the direction at runtime based on the relative position of the light source and the object that it's, uh, that's being rendered. So to find the direction you take the point being rendered and you draw a line from the light source to that point, to that vertex or whatever. And there you have your direction, but when the object moves, then you're going to be drawing a different line. You're going to have a different direction of light that is going to be used for your diffuse calculation. And so as your object moves around the scene, it is going to be dynamically lit from different directions. Now for directional light, we got some object here and uh, it is going to cut a certain number of light rays and that's going to determine its intensity, right? And of course, if you make the, if you change the angle of the object, if you make it more steep, going to cut less light rays, it's going to uh, be more dimly lit. Uh, but if it maintains the same angle, no matter how you move it around, it's always going to have the same intensity. Now let's move that over to the point light. So here we can see at this distance we're cutting two rays. But if we move it closer in, you can see that we're cutting more and more rays. So the intensity of the light increases the closer you approach the light source. So you not only have to take into account the relative positions, the orientation between the light and the object, but also the distance. Those two things factor in to how bright your pixels will be lit. Now that diagram I drew, that was a 2D diagram, but our graphics is in 3D. So the, uh, the attenuation or the loss of intensity over distance is going to follow the inverse square law because it's area, right? Area is a square kind of thing. Uh, so well, if you graph it, it looks like this. So it's going to be y, which is the intensity, is 1 over the distance squared, x being the distance. So you can see here it drops off very quickly. Uh, so you get a pretty fast uh, drop off. But here's another thing. Look at this, look at this graph here. As you approach the point light, your intensity just skyrockets and uh, you go to infinity. So when you, when your object is actually on the point itself, you will have infinite intensity of light. And that's probably not something you want to see in a realistic graphic simulation. The fact is, is that in real life, there are no actual point light sources. There's no light, there's no thing that creates light that is a single point in space with no dimensions. They all have dimensions, right? Like a light bulb. It's going to be a, a sort of spherical thing. So to model this, a, a real point light source, a true point, would be basically 1 over the distance squared for the attenuation. But for something like this, you're going to have like 1 over a distance squared plus b distance plus c. So you're going to add in extra linear terms here and a constant term. And you're going to have coefficients. Uh, and this will allow you to model a, uh, a non-point light a little better. It's going to give you these a, b, and c coefficients that you can use to tweak 
how the light uh, looks in the environment. You can tweak these parameters to get a different feel for the light. And probably most importantly, now you lose that, uh, that as asymptote to infinity. So now if you're right on the point of the light source, you have an intensity of 1 with these, uh, these parameters here. And you get a nice roll off to 0. So, this is what we're going to be using, this is what is normally used for a point light source. And you can tweak those parameters to your liking, you can look up online to find, you know, commonly used parameters. Generally the adjustment of these parameters is more of an art than a science, it's something you kind of play with to get a feel for. And you just kind of tweak it as you're designing levels and scenes. So it's more of an asset generation thing than a programming thing. All right, now for the pretty pictures, on with the code. So we're looking at Gurod point effect. It's going to be similar to the uh, the Gurod effect, but now our uh, our vertex shader. First of all, it's going to have a bunch of stuff. It is going to have the three constants I told you about for the point light: linear attenuation, quadratic attenuation, constant. So this is our squared. This is our just our x, and this is our constant value. And I just picked some values here that I felt looked cool. I just played around with it for a bit. Feel free to play around with these yourself in the code and see what different effects you can get. The other stuff, the light and the material, that's all the same, I believe. And uh, so here's where the magic happens. Now I lied because obviously this is not wasn't in the other one, light position. So light direction has been replaced with light position. And uh, so... We're now going to transform the uh, the mesh from model space into world space first because we need that world space to do our lighting calculations. So we calculate it first and then we put it in here. Uh, then we want to get the... Uh, I think I might have been drunk when I wrote these comments because they don't make any sense. Vertex to... We want to get a vector to the light. So we're getting a vector from the mesh vertex in world position to the light in world position. So here is where we do that, and we get the distance, which is the length of that vector, and we get the direction, which is just that vector normalized. We calculate the attenuation, which is just that inverse square thing. So it's a constant, plus the linear attenuation times the distance, plus the quadratic times the distance squared. So this number is going to be 1 or less than 1. And then we do our diffuse calculation as normal, pretty much. The, uh, the int light diffuse intensity times the attenuation, which is different, that wasn't in the other one, times the uh, the dot product stuff. And the dot product stuff is just the exactly the same. We get the vertex normal rotated into world position, and we dot that with the direction, the light direction, which is now being calculated per vertex instead of just having a single static direction that is used for all vertices. Then we add the diffuse the ambient together, do all that stuff, uh, and then we are done. We return our process vertex with the position and the color, and everything else is the same. And that's all there is to it, really. In the Gurad point scene here, uh, I've added key presses before you could rotate the, uh, the light source, but now the light source doesn't have a direction as a position, so now you can move the light source around in the world. And that works fine, we could run this and it works okay, but the problem is you can't see where the light source actually is, there's no visual indicator, you can only guess based on the lighting of the model. And I thought that was kinda dumb. So what I did was I added a drawing indicator for the light source. Uh, so if you go into Gurad point scene here, uh, I did basically what I wanted to do was make it a sphere. So I added the solid effect into this uh, Gurad point scene and I gave a separate pipeline for drawing the light source. So now we've got two pipelines in this effect and that's fine, that works great. Uh, initialize the pipeline. Down here we can see that after I've drawn the model that is lighted using the, uh, the point effect, then I draw the uh, the light source. So I translate the uh, well the light source. Here it is. I got a index triangle list light indicator, and it's just going to be a, a sphere, plane sphere, with a solid uh, effect vertexes. And there's the pipeline. And here I'm just going to take that sphere. I'm going to translate it by the position of the light. 
then I am going to, uh, why do I, oh, I got to bind a rotation vector to it. So I just use identity because it doesn't need to be rotated. It's a sphere. And then I draw that mother trucker. And up here in the constructor, I'm just initializing the color part of the vertices for the light indicator. And that's it. And it works pretty good except for one issue. So let's take a look at that. So here it is. Here is our light indicator. It's just that little sphere there. And we can see that our, uh, our monkey dude, Suzanne Dudette, I guess, is being uh, lit there based on this light. And if we move the light around in the scene, let's see if I can move it around a bit. Yeah, we can see that uh, Suzanne is getting some different lighting there. Pretty cool. And you can, this indicator is nice because it lets us visually check uh, position of the light and the actual lighting being done, seeing if it's working correctly. And it does appear to be working correctly. Now, let me show you something interesting here. Let me, let's see if you can figure out what the problem is. So I've got this light source and I'm going to drive it into the model. So here we go. It's now all the way through the model because you, you can see it's not, it's on the other side. It has to be on the other side because we're not getting any lighting here. So it's on the other side of the model and yet it's being drawn in front of the model. Why is that? I thought we solved this problem with Z buffering. So can you think of why we're still having this problem? Well, the answer is pretty, it's not that hard once you think about it. Um, we've got two different pipelines here. Both of these pipelines embed their own Z buffer. Those are different Z buffers. So when I'm drawing the light effect after I've, or the light indicator after I've drawn the model, I'm drawing that over top and I'm not consulting the Z buffer that was built up while drawing the model and therefore I'm just going to draw over everything. So that's not good, right? You probably want all of your things in your scene to use the same Z buffer. So that's what I did here, shared Z buffer, include occlusion of light indicator in point scene. So I made a little change and I, I did a little clever change here, I made a change that didn't cause me to have to change all of the other scenes and effects and stuff. So in pipeline.h here, I include memory, and uh, I'm going to make, let's look down here. So I changed the z buffer from being embedded as an object to being embedded as a shared pointer. So now the z buffer is embedded as a shared pointer, and uh, I add another constructor to the pipeline. So the original constructor, what it'll do is it doesn't take, it just takes graphics and it will create a Z buffer by shared pointer in here and it'll initialize that. So that means that everything that has been made up until this point will still work. It'll work fine, it'll work exactly the same. We didn't change the interface, just the implementation. Again, that is encapsulation at work. But I've added a new constructor that can take a uh, shared pointer by value and it will create another reference to that shared object. So we take this by value, that'll create a copy of the shared pointer, increasing the reference count, and then we're going to move that resource into our embedded shared pointer. And here we just do a little check, a little sanity check to make sure that the size of our Z buffer that we've just received matches the size of the screen that we're going to be drawing on. Otherwise, we're going to have a bad time. And that's basically it. And begin frame, we just got to change here. Now we're going to be pointing, pointer to Z buffer, pointer to clear. Then in Gurod point scene, we are, instead of just constructing it with its default Z buffer, we are going to make a shared Z buffer. And we are going to... Uh, initialize that into a separate shared pointer to Z buffer here that the uh, the scene is going to manage for itself. And then we pass that on to the pipeline and the uh, light indicator pipeline and they will both be using that Z buffer. And then down here, one important change is the second pipeline, the light indicator pipeline, we don't call begin frame. Because if we call begin frame, it would wipe out the Z buffer and we lose all the information built up for the model. So we only call begin frame for the first pipeline in the scene. The rest of them, we don't do that. Now, the reason why I use this shared pointer architecture is because it allows me to keep those two different cases here with the, uh, the two constructors. So in the case of the first one here, uh, the pipeline creates its own Z buffer and it will destroy it when it's done. But in the second case here, I can pass in a shared one and uh, 
that is owned by other things and it will not try to destroy it when the pipeline is destroyed unless that pipeline happens to be the last thing that is owning the object so the uh, shared pointer enables this situation where i don't have to change all of my other scenes to match the new uh, z buffer system all right now let's take a look at when we go into the model where we're approaching it and now we are through the model come back out in out in nice so now we've got occlusion between these objects and these two different that are being rendered in these two different pipelines because the pipelines share a single z buffer all right one last little thing i want to leave you with today here we've got a scene and i've just got a single plane it's made up of two triangles here and here's how it's being lit now, what do you think about this? What do you think? You think this is the effect that we should be seeing, or do you think there's something wrong with this? Let me know. Have a think about it. I'm not going to tell you. That's going to be a cliffhanger for next episode. Next episode, we're going to look at this. We're going to we're going to analyze this. We're going to see is this okay? Can we improve on this? And in doing so, we're going to learn a new shader technique. And until then, as always, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please click the like button. It helps a lot. And I will see you soon with some more 3D fundamentals.